to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg from the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. It's actually a beautiful day without snow, and uh, people have actually come in, uh, uh, and not they're not shoveling, so we have an audience today, and all of you as well. We appreciate your being with us. Of course, Virtual Book Signing is a show that brings interesting and significant new books to you. Uh, the publishers have to bring them in for us, and they're uh, welcoming this forum, this broadcast uh, and bringing them in. I think they're interesting discussions and we hope you'll enjoy the books and having them on your shelves. You certainly will enjoy the reading. If you're watching now on the archives, we'll probably have first edition signed available for you as well for as long as they hold out. Uh, this is an interesting book, so I think they're not going to hold out long. Uh, so today, uh, uh, we have Richard Campanella, a research professor of geography from Tulane University. His previous books include Delta Urbanism, Geographies of New Orleans, Time and Place in New Orleans, New Orleans Then and Now. He's won two Louisiana Endowment of the Humanities Book of the Year awards, two New Orleans, uh, Orleans Gulf South Booksellers Association awards, and an Excellent in Teaching award from the Newcomb College Institute of Tulane University. Well, he's here today with his latest book, Lincoln in New Orleans, the 1828 and 1831 flatboat trips and their place in history. University of Louisiana uh, Press produces this and we appreciate uh, their sending uh, Rich out to us. 380 pages with plenty of interesting color illustrations, by the way, and maps in there, uh, and it's $35. You know, I, one of the things I like, uh, Rich, about this uh, is the chapter headings mm. uh, that bring one back to the yes. old yeah. uh, way that books would have it. It's yes. almost like, uh, contents mm -hmm. in front of each uh, uh, chapter so you know what that chapter is going to bring you. And I, I like that, especially great, great. getting questions for you. I could uh, skip something okay. if I needed to. Uh, now let's set the tone a bit of this book. Uh, the 1850s were known uh, as a great personal growth time on Lincoln's part. Uh, but the years related here, 1828 to 1831, and then also going between 31 and 65, but really the crux of the book, are those two voyages to New Orleans of Lincoln, also showed great growth, as your uh, excellent uh, book shows. Uh, indeed, in 1832, the day, the, the year after when he came back from the second trip, he was elected captain in the Black Hawk War, and if you remember, he said of that success, that election as captain, uh, that, that was a success that had given me more pleasure than any mm -hmm. I have had since. Mm -hmm. So those years really brought something uh, to the fore for him. Uh, you're a New Orleans scholar, so uh, this story of Lincoln is a natural fit. And by the way, this is more than just Lincoln. It's a fascinating book on the river, Mississippi, during that time and what that culture was, what Lincoln saw, what was there, uh, how New Orleans was and Natchez and others places that he stopped at along the way. So it's really the western part of the United States as well and a bit of a history during Lincoln's time of what it was like to be there, what it looked like, what it felt and smelled like. Now, you're a geographer, a uh, uh, professor of. What unique perspectives do geographers bring to historical works such as this? Well, it's the spatial perspective. Uh, so, um, uh, l looking looking at history and culture uh, in in uh, uh, through maps uh, and through maps through time. So it's that spatial dimension, the relationship of these patterns to the underlying landscape, uh, the landscape and riverscape that Lincoln saw, how it transformed, how it affected him, uh, is, is that angle. And um, I, I should say that uh, all my previous work has been, as a New Orleans geographer, I study these, these spatial patterns generally within city limits, uh, looking at why certain ethnic groups live in certain areas, what patterns do they form, how is the cityscape, the uh, architectural geography, where do we see certain house types. Uh, and when um, I completed my previous book, this was in late 07 or so, I had an opportunity to revisit a very influential childhood moment uh, in when I was reading my very first Lincoln book and I learned of his trip down here. This is this is when I was five years old. Uh, and, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, I've always wanted to look into that particular episode 
uh, to see if there's there's a larger story there. And, I, and as often happens, you start looking into it and you realize there's all these interesting tributaries to the story, literally in this case. Uh, and so it, as it turned out, um, it's, 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 a, it's a Lincoln story, but it's also, it's a Mississippi River story, it's a New Orleans story, and it's an American story. And um, if, if you could just hold up that map there. This is a wonderful map. This is a fascinating map. Um, if you, what, I had a lot of fun making this. Uh, went through all the records and in an Excel spreadsheet calculated uh, the number of, of days and weeks and months and years that Lincoln spent in the various places of his life. And got that into, my background was really in the mapping sciences, so I got that into a GIS. And what you're looking at here is uh, the, the more yellow you see, the more time he spent in those areas. So naturally you see his Kentucky childhood represented, the seven years there, the 14 years of his Indiana coming of age, uh, and then his move to Illinois where he becomes uh, a professional. Uh, you'll see his travels for his various president, his campaigns. But then you'll see one fascinating outlier there. And you see that little yellow dot all the way down here. And, and basically this book, tries to explain that fascinating exception. What he saw, how it influenced him, and the larger, I would call it um, an economic geographical system of the development of the West and how New Orleans played a role in that. You'll find this in the book. Uh, and it's really interesting to just get into this and just see where he was. It's fascinating in that regard. Um, now, of course, New Orleans, you live there. Uh, came out of Brooklyn, you mm -hmm. told me. Uh, but you describe it in great detail, especially in the in two indices that are there. <laughs> One on flat boating during right. the time, and uh, Lincoln, of course, is described before that in the book, but the rest of it is really, in that appendix, is what it was really like on the river. And uh, also then New Orleans itself, right. what he would have encountered there and what the whole milieu was. Uh, very exotic and almost foreign <laughs> city, as you mm -hmm. say. Uh, but it was a thriving city for the same reason Chicago was, right. its location. That's right. Uh, New Orleans, you could almost think of New Orleans as being the Chicago of the early 19th century. Uh, it had a mon monopolistic control over Western markets. So picture, uh, I have a time sequence of maps there showing the American people moving down after the revolution and particularly after the Louisiana Purchase, many of your ancestors, if you have deep roots in this area, coming uh, down the Ohio River Valley, over the Cumberland Gap, into the west, um, and uh, cutting, uh, transforming environments, cutting down trees, raising crops. One family might raise corn, another one raises hogs to the point that they have more that they can, can consume, and so a frontier exchange economy starts. You reach a point where you satisfy all local needs, you have these surpluses, so what do you want to do? What you need is cash and merchandise, so you need to get these to an external market. You, it's really tough to get it, this is pre-steamboats now, to get it up the Ohio, back over the mountains to the great sources of demand. So what you can do is float it down to New Orleans and then get it to market there. So a whole generation of, of young uh, Westerners participated in this, taking flatboats down and then taking steamboats back up. And as exceptional as Lincoln came to be, he was an exemplar of that, of that uh, whole demographic. We were just showing the population of the United States during various decades that you, you showed uh, in here. Here in the upper left corner is the time period we're talking about. That's about 1830, right over there, what the population would have been. And the rest of this, from the left page to the right page, is how the population grew in the United States into the Northwest Territories right, uh, right at the time Lincoln was there. Uh, fascinating, but yes. Uh, so what was New Orleans made up of? What were the various, I mean, various populations that were there. It was quite the, the melting pot. Uh, the, the two major ethnic groups uh, prior to the Louisiana Purchase, uh, you would generally have a, one major demographic group there, ethnic group, and these were broadly known as the Creoles. Uh, people, and this was kind of a pan-racial sort of identity, unified by mostly uh, a Francophone, deep roots in Louisiana society. And after the Louisiana Purchase, just as Americans are pouring westward, they're also pouring to the southwest to become part of this great economic opportunity. And these were Anglophones, more likely to be Protestant. They brought all their cultural baggage with them. And so for in Lincoln's, in the era that Lincoln visited, 
you have this, this fascinating, contentious, and oftentimes uh, rather ugly um, uh, power battle between the deep-rooted Creole population and the incoming Anglo-American population. So, and it really peaks in the 1820s and 1830s when that shift moves from, from Creole to Anglo and toward uh, an English-speaking society. Uh, so he visits the city uh, right at the peak of, of, uh, of that tension playing out, and many would point out to this day that New Orleans is not completely absorbed into that larger national culture. Well, of course, apart from Abraham Lincoln, there's great deal uh, of detail on the river life of a fl uh, flat boatman. Uh, so let's start that way. Um, I have a book that just barely shows uh, what a flatboat may have looked like at the right. time. Uh, give us an overview of the flatboating uh, experience uh, briefly, because we're going to go into sure, it, of course. Sure. But what was that like? Who were they? How were they important at the time? Uh, when did they peak, etc.? Okay. Uh, I, I just want to point out that um, the appendices appear to be at the end of this book. Originally, at, as a geographer, I want to put things in context, spatial and temporal context. They were originally the first two chapters of Western commerce, the evolution of all these boating type typologies, and what New Orleans was like. Unfortunately, that put Lincoln first appearing on like page 183. Uh, and my publisher, you have to have one battle with your publisher. And, uh, and this was the battle. Um, they won, and I, perhaps it's for the better that that backstory is now in the appendix. But if you want to read the book the way I intended it's it, like read the Hawaii, appendix first. If you remember the, 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 the novel Hawaii, and the first you know, 3,000 pages were... Right. Hawaii, the islands being made, and <laughs> right. before you got into the story. <laughs> I thought, found it the most fascinating. But Great. I'll say this, uh, this does work, at least for me, Great. because I think I got more out of the appendices after I've read your overview through Lincoln's eyes, Great. and then got into the appendices, I got more out of them. Great. So it Great. wasn't bad to have Great. them back there. So. And it, it just about the flatboat trade. Um, okay, so, so what a flatboat is, is a very simple vernacular vessel um, uh, made out of uh, usually poplar or oak, uh, usually by um, the, the people who are actually going to take it down. Uh, it's a very simple raft with walls and what they would also oftentimes call the wigwam, a little shelter, uh, and it, it had no power source. The power was the movement of the river. So uh, sometimes they would put up a sail, but for the most part, if you could hold that illustration sure. up again, uh, uh, guided by a crew of as few as two to sometimes six or seven, you'll notice the two steering oars pr protruding from the sides. That's what gave flatboats the nickname Broadhorns because it looked like uh, you know the, the horns of a, of a cattle. Uh, there would be a, a steering oar in the rear, there would be poles, and sometimes they would have a gouger in front which would guide it. Uh, the reason why steering was so important was treachery lie along the, 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 periphery, the, the banks of the river. The one thing you did not want was to get stuck on a sandbar. And in fact, as many of you know, Lincoln later in life invented a rather, he's the only president with a patent, uh, a rather awkward device designed to lift steamboats, in this case, off sandbars, which was such a problem. But he became so, the only president to have that's such right. a patent. Exactly, exactly, to Page this day. 262 in the patent book for mechanical for 1848, if you're looking for there it. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you take a flatboat down. It, it's guided by the river. Uh, all sorts of obstacles, bandits would attack. These were uh, these these were you know small crews, oftentimes unarmed. They would have cash with them. They were sitting targets, and lo and behold, Lincoln was. I think we could accurately say was almost murdered the night before he first set foot in New Orleans, attacked on a flatboat. Once you get to New Orleans, uh, you sell off your commodities, and you the, the flatboat is now useless. So they were disassembled and sold off as, as scrap timber. And to this day, the term barge board house is very common. Everyone knows in New Orleans knows what a barge board house is. And uh, this is scrap timber, and oftentimes it was used as, uh, as wood in some of the uh, working class houses. Uh, and you see it to this day. Is it 1820s, 1830s? Not necessarily so. It might be barges from the turn of the century. I found one a couple.